Lunch. Um, so, let me introduce, uh, we've got uh, Dennis Honig Oinsberg, and I'm sorry I got that, Dennis, uh, Dennis, I totally mangled your surname, from Zalando. Then we have uh, Ina Budder, Christoph Riesen, and Lauren Van Breen from Circular Fashion, Sustainable, and WikiRate. Okay, um, Dennis, can you just tell us a little bit about what Zalando does, in particular your new Zimpact program? Dennis. Sure. Uh, so I think I'm going to, you all probably know Zalando, so you can buy fashion online uh, on our, in our fashion store. Um, but today I'm more here for a citizenship project that we're doing. Um, so there are two reasons why I'm excited to be here today. One professional and one personal. Um, the professional one is uh, I get very excited by systems and seeing system change. And I truly believe that we're in a historic time kind of where we see that fashion industry could really change uh, because we see pressure on the one side and willingness on the other side. We see lots of brands getting engaged. We see lots of solutions that are out there already. Um, and of course, we as at Zalando, we wanted to find a way to contribute to this change. Um, and as a tech and fashion company, we decided to launch an accelerator to support social innovations that uh, use digital technology to increase transparency in the, in the fashion industry because we believe that digital technology can be a leverage uh, for all the good work that's already done out there and that maybe helps us to get to uh, a better fashion industry to see that change faster than we, uh, than we uh, expected today because most of the fashion industry is rather not digital. Uh, it's uh, mm. rather the opposite. Um, so I'm really excited to have three ventures uh, with us today that are going to show us a bit of how they already have an impact on the fashion industry. And that brings me to my personal reason why I'm excited to be here. Um, I must admit that only recently fashion became personal for me um, because I experienced a new level of how fashion affects my life. Um, and that was uh, very closely tied to a date in September when my uh, little girl was born. Uh, so my first baby. Uh, I'm a dad of a healthy girl now. Um, and dressing her in the mornings I experience what a difference it makes on what color I choose, what prints I put her on, what material I dress her in. And that's choices I do, but it affects how people react to her, to her already. Um, and um, this kind of reaction will be even stronger in the future, her growing up. And the freedom of expressing herself will also change. Um, so um, I think with all the technology in place and stuff, it always helps me to remind myself why we're actually doing this. And that's why I wanted to use that moment also to thank all of you who get engaged for uh, changing that industry, uh, for making it a more fair, more equal, more sustainable, in the end, a more positive industry and turning this industry into a force for good because it can so shape society. Uh, and I think that if we only look at all the problems that we have in our supply chains and all the stuff that we uh, are talking about for decades already, uh, we have to see that positive uh, impact as well. And that drives some people to uh, even become more of a change maker in that industry. Okay, thank you. Uh, perhaps we can come back to talk a little bit around the impact as well later, later on. But I do want to crack on and get to our, our innovators. So each of our panel is going to have uh, Two minutes, what a surprise, uh, to pitch about their company and uh, your innovation. And then we'll have a bit more of a chat around more general supply chain transparency challenges. So, Ina from Circular Fashion, why don't you go first? I will have the cards in play. So you have two minutes to pitch us your innovative approach. All right. Yeah, so at Circular Fashion, we're convinced that transparency should go even beyond um, supply chain. So we're creating transparency across the whole product life cycle. And probably you wonder why. Um, I think this is something that we all agree on. We would love to imagine a future without waste. A future where all of our products can be regenerated to the same quality again. But currently, this is not happening. Like, less than 1% of all textiles are regenerated that way. And the big reason is we are lacking transparency. Transparency from three different like, major stakeholder perspectives. Um, fashion brands are lacking information on how to design clothing for recycling. Customers are lacking information how to return clothing or like, where to return them in the right channels. And sorting companies lack information uh, on identifying recyclable clothing and guide them to the right recycler. Um, and to kind of lever this... Um, 
um, yeah, journey towards a circular economy. We need a completely new system that can allow this transparency and an interconnection between all stakeholders uh, in the supply chain and the product life. So this is exactly what our innovation is all about. So um, we like, developed a circular design software that um, supports fashion brands in making the right choices um, through validated materials, and know-how to yeah, design for circularity and to assure that they're finally reaching the right recycler, we equip each garment with a circular fashion ID that can tell anybody exactly what it is made of and exactly to which recycler it needs to go. Um, so scanning this code, customers can see everything about the sustainable production of this garment, but also about the full product life cycle, how long it was owned before and what is my incentive to kind of reuse it, recycle it, etc. And once um, time has come and the customer returns the garments uh, to one of our sorting partners, they can use the ID to identify the right recycler who can actually regenerate this particular garment to a new fiber again. So this is why we're convinced that transparency is a major key point um, to enable circularity. Yeah. Um, how important is, uh, or how can circular economy cope with uh, mixed fibers and garments? How important is it to move away, to move towards fewer types of fibers and garments for developing circular fiber. Um, we're working in this space now for a couple of years and it's like really interesting how um, technology is packing up. Like it's in the beginning blended fibers were the major challenge but uh, today we can observe also yeah more innovations that can cope with these kind of things but still it is very important to know the accurate um, composition of the fiber to make it economically viable and also to know that is it a healthy uh, material. We don't want to cycle trash around like we really want to be um, at a very high level and create um, a closed loop on a sustainable level. Okay, thank you very much. Christoph, turning to you, um, can you tell us a little bit about what your business does, its innovation, and how you're developing your, uh, your processes around looking at raw material traceability? Christoph. Yeah, thank you very much. So I'm, I'm Christoph, Pro um, I'm product manager and uh, responsible for data analytics at Sustainable. And um, Sustainable is a cloud platform for brands and suppliers. And Sustainable enables brands to really assess their supply chain's um, sustainability, meaning social and ecological impacts and connected risks. And how do we do that? So, first of all, um, Sustainable um, helps your brand to efficiently disclose your supply chain. And uh, this is done by really um, a sophisticated invitation system and um, in the end the, the goal is really that you identify all your direct and indirect suppliers and their production sites. So once you did this, you can really invite your suppliers to share information with you, sustainability information, and um, once you have information, you can use sus the, sustainable, uh, the sustainable platform to uh, perform sophisticated data analytics we have a dashboard uh, showing all kinds of risk-related and uh, sustainability-related um, uh, statistics. And we also calculate footprints, like CO2 or water footprints, uh, which is very complex. And uh, we visualize your supply chain for better communication. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, so what sort of um, data do you find it's easy to use? And what sort of data, I mean, what's the data that is easy to get hold of? And what's the data that's sort of the, the real struggle? Yeah, th that's a good question. So actually, you, you cannot really, um, you, have to, you have to classify the data a bit. So the first step is always, of course, who are my suppliers? I mean, my, my direct suppliers, that's very easy, but who are my indirect suppliers, right? And where are they producing? So which production sites are involved and uh, take part in the production of a certain product? That's the first step. And this, of course, also is some kind of a research project process. And you have to ask your suppliers who are their suppliers and so on, ideally all the way up to the source. And um, of course, Maybe uh, suppliers don't want to disclose their suppliers, so you have, to be, um, you have to cope with data gaps as well. We can do that as a sustainable. And so secondly, of course, there are the more granular data, the, the data you really need to calculate footprints, uh, which gets really granular. And uh, of course, this is something um, 
uh, the, you, you mainly have to, you have to be in a position where you can put some pressure on your suppliers to really disclose that. And there might be confidentiality issues. So we have, a, um, approach, we have an approach where we allow for communicating only highly aggregated data to avoid that, that the supplier has to really you know, disclose all the data. But we always keep a reference on the granular data in case of a scandal or some, some research that you can always find back to the granule data in such cases. Okay, no, thank you very much indeed. Um, Lorraine then, turning to you, same, same process, two minutes, give us your pitch on what your business does and um, where, where the innovation is. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so at Wikirate we've developed an open research platform that literally allows anyone to actually gather, analyze and discuss data about corporate responsibility. So really anything that is about the social or environmental behavior of companies that is disclosed publicly. Um, but the information that is disclosed publicly today is actually often hidden in PDF reports multiple clicks away from a home page or it's hidden behind these huge paywalls like from a Bloomberg portal for instance and so this public resource is not really public anymore and uh, we're trying to bring it together in one place so that the public can actually access it and together we can make sure that we can advise companies and help companies on improving their practices. Um, some of the more recent innovations uh, on our part are really focusing on supply chains. And one of the features that we've developed this year is actually where we can connect a company to its business relations. And by doing so, we can suddenly start to ask questions that you normally wouldn't get the answer to in a CSR report. So you could say, for instance, um, how many of Nike's suppliers have a health and safety training for their employees? Or um, what are the human rights policies of H&M's investors? So you really start to go across these networks in your assessment of what is responsible behavior. Um, another uh, more innovative feature that we've actually developed or, or launched this year is a search tool for supply chain workers where we're using this relationship data to actually uh, inform workers of the brands that they're producing products for. Now this doesn't sound very groundbreaking. We all know who we work for, uh, but for these people People, it really is and when you think about um, them actually being able to then find out what supply chain policies these brands have that means they can actually be informed of their rights when they go into collective negotiations with their employers and so they themselves are actually able to improve their own working conditions which is a huge development for supply chains yeah thanks great no thank you um how do you differentiate then i mean you mentioned that there's a lot of data that's now hidden behind paywalls and you know, reports and anything else how do you extract that? So that's actually a really good question. Um, so where we can, we try to scrape, and we've developed a tool where we can actually scrape tables that are in PDF reports as well, so it's, it's semi-automated. Um, but in a lot, of t a lot of the time, we actually still need humans to process these documents because the machine can't. And what we do is we set up collective research projects with uh, mostly students or volunteers from NGOs, uh, and they go through the assessment using questions that we have on our platform to extract the data that we need. And, but do you find that there's, uh, you know, there's some data that you just simply can't get because it's, it's a proprietary, it's owned by someone else? I mean, I guess you're not looking for that data. You're still trying to get the stuff that's all publicly in the public domain. Yeah, so most of the time when, when you actually have to pay to get data, it's been analyzed and it's been aggregated to a, a, a level where we can all kind of understand it and it's been contextualized. If I would just tell you a couple hundred tons of emissions from an airliner, it doesn't mean much. We need to see the context. And that's what these institutions do. Um, but we've built the mechanisms on our platform so that literally anyone could recreate that assessment. And so with the public data, we could go all the way from the ground up uh, to these higher level analyses. Okay, great. So I'd, I'd like to ask a few questions of the, of the panel now. So firstly, um, challenges to supply chain transparency. You know, obviously, you're trying to address it different ways. But more generally, what are the real challenges to dealing with supply chain transparency? Dennis, do you want to kick us off? Well, it, I think it depends a lot who you ask. Uh, so if you ask a couple of pioneers, uh, they would say data is not an issue. They say we have all the data that we need, but we don't know how to turn that data into information or that information into action. If you talk to small brands, very small brands, sustainable brands, they would say probably the same because they know their supply chain. If you talk to everyone in between, they will probably argue that data, getting data, the right data, deep data, correct data, all this kind of stuff is still a challenge. 
Technically, it's not, but it's not efficient yet. It's not scalable. People are still taking notes in factories to count uh, numbers of workers. And all, it, it's not at a stage yet where other industries, for example, uh, already are. Um, so I think it's, it's more about not only asking what's missing, but how to democratize the whole movement. Because at the moment, you only see the front runners and the worst case, but in between, there's a lot. Uh, so I think there's a variety of use cases uh, that uh, still need to be solved, yeah. Okay. Uh, Ina, what, what about for you? Um, the challenges that we see are also on different levels. Um, I would say, like, one level is the material um, assessment, because we set up a circular material database where we actually assure that um, and validate the recyclability by, like, from one specific material with one specific recycler. And for that, we're co completely dependent on the data accuracy that we get, because this is yeah, crucial for it. So um, what we do on the one hand, we um, have also lab testing to kind of see if the like, information that we got provided are true. But more important, we try to establish incentives to actually provide the real data, because um, um, in the future, like there, or in the near future, actually, raw material prices will grow, so will increase. Um, suppliers would be happy to purchase their own materials back, like the regenerated textiles. Um, and if they are honest and trustful about their like ingredients in the very beginning, they would have a better outcome in the end. So we can kind of increase the recycling um, quality. So that's one ex um, uh, incentive. And the same um, challenge is basically for like on, on product and brand level um, because there are not legislations to kind of make transparent all the different components of a product like if it's the percentage too small like so um, we try with our um, circular design software we have a configurator where all the different parts of a product are defined and once a brand purchases this material it is saved on the product side so we have actually each little component um, saved there so this is how we approach it. Christoph, um, I would imagine for you, that, you know, it's all about the data, isn't it? So how do you get or incentivize uh, suppliers, perhaps down tier two, tier two, tier three, tier four, to, be, to, 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 to engage and to provide the data that your sort of tool is looking for? Well, that must be really tricky. Yeah, so of course, I mean, we cannot solve the problem if a supplier doesn't want to participate. We cannot force him. If at all, the, the brand must be able to do that. So uh, what Sustainable does is really it provides the, uh, the technology to do this in a very efficient way because imagine for, a, for a big companies with complex supply chains and textile supply chains are often very complex right from tier one, especially considering subcontract and relationships. And so in order to disclose that, that's a lot of work, you know. And so we try, firstly, we try to reduce the effort with our platform. And of course, secondly, we really have these concepts to really allow for, we, we um, try to leverage the data as much as we can. So even if the supplier says, okay, I don't want to disclose my suppliers, um, then we can offer him the option to only disclose the production sites and not the names. Um, only disclose some uh, sustainability information, highly aggregated, to um, get the most we can Considering, and we know that that it is as a, as a fact, uh, it's a fact you can't ignore it. That there are, will be suppliers that do not want to disclose all of their information. Sure. I mean, same question to to you, Lorraine. I mean, I guess you must sometimes get frustrated. You can't get to the data you want to get to that will really give your your customers more, you know, the real sort of information that you're trying to give them. How much of a frustration is that? So very much, <laughs> but I think it's. For us, also a question of um, how can we actually convey what they can get from disclosing more. So it's not only about them having to give something up. And actually, maybe just to uh, give a little anecdote, just earlier, like in 2017, just under 100 fashion companies actually published their list of suppliers. It's just tier one, sometimes tier two. So it's not much. but. They started to publish this, and it was really kind of scary for them because 
I mean, it's still, they have the best morals and they want to be transparent, but it's still considered commercially sensitive information. Um, and so if I would know where Gucci makes its handbags, maybe I, I want to copy it and I would go and produce there as well. So with all this in mind, they still did it. And um, this early this year, they came back and they reported on their experience. And what they told us was actually that they ended up receiving a lot more information than what they had given up in the first place. Because suddenly there were so many stakeholders out there that could tell them other bits and pieces of information following their lead. And so, for instance, um, if you really want to kind of convince a brand, of course, um, sometimes you, you need a little bit more stick, but in general, I, we like the more carrot approach and we try to explain why it can help them really to do a better job and improve their own practices if they just give up a little bit of information. Okay, thank you very much. Um, next I want to ask is really bringing on from that. What, you guys are innovating in the fashion space. What do you want brands to be doing? Um, I know they potentially your customers, so you're going to want to be nice about them, but you know, go on, tell us what you'd like to see them do better. Um, Christoph, let me start. Yeah, so there we have a pretty specific um, experience. So, of course, when we approach brands, we uh, usually start at the, for example, the CR department, right? And today, almost any fashion brand has either uh, its own department for CR or at least one guy responsible for CR. So, our experience is really, so we try to really assess the complete um, sustainability of the supply chain. So we, we really noticed that um, currently CR is very good in communication and specialized, but if, uh, in, in my opinion, um, CR should be better integrated into the company in, in often, that, that's what we see. So what does that mean? That, mean, uh, that means that it should be uh, better connected to supply chain management because it's, it is connected to supply chain management. If you want to assess your sustainability, you have to know and manage your supply chain. And it should be also connected to risk management. And why is that? Because the, the databases, it's actually the same databases. And you, from this data, if you analyze it, you get a lot of important knowledge about risk, supply chain management, and sustainability. There's a high synergy but companies do not leverage that. And one of the reasons is that the CR department often is very separate, is very great in communication, but it's not well connected and integrated into the company. Great point. Still a lot of non-integration of these things. Uh, Lauren? Yes, yeah, so what we would imagine companies could do a bit more as, of course, share more information, but it's also about how companies share information. So, um, for instance, not sharing it in a PDF report, share it in a CSV file or a JSON. It sounds a lot harder than it is. Um, have a policy about open data so that people can actually then access and reuse the information without being legally prosecuted, potentially, um, but also actually um, looking at ways of integrating systems. So really making it easier for people to work with what you've produced, because you put a lot of time and effort into getting this data out there as well. Thank you. Ina, same question to you. What do you want brands to do more um, of? Yeah, so we would love to see brands incorporating those strategies or like those um, ideas about transparency and circularity really in the core of their business model and the strategies that is much more easier for every department to, to live up on that and to kind of integrate those ideas and make them happen. Um, as well as kind of yeah, empowering and like requesting more transparency from their suppliers because it's a win-win situation in the end. Like if, if we have more transparency, everything can um, kind of yeah, be more in healthy closed loops so we can create new materials out of it. It's a, it's a business model behind that story. Um, and yeah, last but not least, um, also the trust to the consumer will like, pay off. I, I'm very, pretty sure on that. Sure. Dennis, same question to you, but just perhaps slightly change a little bit. I know we've had in Europe changes to the data laws. Do you get any sense... Um, that um, the change in the DB, DD, GDPR, um, that coming in, has made brands suddenly become a little, bit, little more reluctant to be open with data. Is that something you come across? Might not be the... Uh, honestly, we will still find out, uh, because <laughs> most brands are still uh, dealing with the basics there. Um, I think, I would, I mean, you all now said that brands should engage more. Um, I think there are a lot of brands that are already quite committed. Um, and I think that in the whole sustainability discussion, we need to 
like acknowledge this too and uh, also celebrate, but it's, it's, it's not only the first movers anymore. So it's way beyond Hess Natur and uh, Patagonia. So everyone, like every, every brand that's serious about fashion is looking into sustainability right now. I think the challenge is that we have to get from the pilot to scale. Um, and there, I think there are two things. One is the pioneers have to be bolder in testing new technologies because scaling the old approach doesn't always work. So this is where digital technology comes in, where big data comes in, where AI, algorithms, blockchain, all these buzzwords will eventually have an impact on. Um, and I think that it's the first movers that can help the rest of the industry again to get there. Um, and the others, uh, all the non-first movers, if it is about sustainability, my only ask would be to copy and paste the hell out of it. Uh, there is uh, what, whatever works to make sus sustainability grow or succeed, I think learn from those that have already pioneered it. I mean, there are quite a few um, industry initiatives, uh, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition or Fashion for Good or whatever, like pre-competitive spaces where brands can actually talk seriously about stuff and not only about the stuff that's working, but also about what's not working yet. And I think this is the big next step to really uh, get more out of those conversations, dare more and be more open with other brands to learn in a collective impact approach. Sure. I mean, you're, you're dead right. You know, the old uh, sustainability cliche that uh, pilots never fail, but pilots never scale is really is still true, unfortunately. Um, okay, just to kind of coming towards lunch, um, how motivated, and of course you're talking to all the rest of the room here, how, how motivated do you think the industry is to make the changes to enable more transparency? Um, and what are the kind of, how do we communicate the benefits of doing so? Who wants to go first? But, Lorraine, do you want to go first? So I think just as Dennis briefly mentioned, there's definitely uh, quite a bit of movement in the fashion industry. And there's hmm. definitely a couple of companies that are really leading the way. And I think there's a lot to learn for the rest. Um, but as an industry as a whole, I don't think <laughs> we're there yet. And we already briefly talked a little bit, or I mentioned the, the carrot and stick a little bit, and sometimes you really do need a little bit of stick. And one of the things, uh, you already mentioned, Christoph, the, the risk assessment, we also need to start talking in risks assessments. So for instance, what if you had a child labor incident? What is what, how do you deal with that scandal? How many people would be needed to, to mediate that? How, many, how much time, how many product sales do you lose? And let's turn that into some of money so we can give them a price tag and show what transparency can avoid. Um, so I think that that's one of the things we could do to help the industry as a whole move faster. <laughs> okay, um, Ina. Um, yeah, so I think risk management is a very important point. Um, further than that, um, we, we're convinced that kind of brands should, um, or like we, we see an unstoppable momentum here at the moment. We see that um, a lot of things are changing and we, um, yeah, we think it's an incredible momentum. Uh, still, we would um, yeah, encourage to see the real business model behind, or like the business case behind transparency, uh, because it's not only about being like trustful, I mean, this is a super important point, um, but still, it's also great to be transparent and to see the business models behind. Um, creating transparency about one product can actually have a huge um, impact on like the new business models like uh, renting services etc using products more efficiently and more sustainable throughout the full life cycle um, is another important aspect so yeah we're totally up for that okay uh, Christoph yeah so for me another question is really um, I think the fashion industry is is great at communication but uh, the question is often so what is really beneficial and what is not and that is sometimes really hard to tell so I think so far in the in the past we we have gone through an era where there was a lot of communication but pretty loose and very sometimes very inconcrete so our goal is really to also enable companies to um, really communicate numbers, concrete and reliant numbers. And of course, you do not want to want to communicate granular data to your customer. But um, if you have at the end of the day one number, and in the future maybe you even can compare the number between uh, the same product categories. And in the back, you have granular data to prove that this number is true. That would be an ideal scenario, I, I think, in our opinion. Okay, and, and Dennis, for you. Um, how motivated do you think the industry is? And you know, where are we on the journey right now? 
I, I think it's not a lack of motivation. Um, I think that the industry is doing its homework, um, but we're not yet at a stage where we know how to communicate this to the customer. Um, I think that sustainability in the past was rather something that we did, uh, as, that brands did for themselves, but it wasn't a selling argument. It was risk prevention. Um, but I totally see that there's a growing momentum from customer side too, and I think this comes back to the business case. I think we need to understand of how to communicate the good stuff um, and not by making the other more bad, but making the good stuff more attractive, more sexy. Um, and I think that this is where my big hope is that if we manage to change the behavioral gap of customers, so most of them say they want to buy sustainable fashion, but very few do, um, if we find out why, uh, and if customers use their power, I think that most brands are already at a stage where they uh, will follow the customer and it will be easier to follow them if the customer demands it. Um, and I think this is still a bit lacking. Okay, no, thank you. Well, um, good news, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, um, the question, I'm just going to come to that. There's a great way that all our... Um, our startups here um, are going to be available in the media lounge afterwards um, and what they're looking for is to set up um, some networking uh, speed dates um, over the course of the next afternoon. We'll, I, I, some of the uh, Fashion Sustain team will be there to set these up for you. Um, so in fact we'll set them down right at the front here. So what I was going to suggest, I got written down here what you're after, but why don't you tell us yourselves the sort of people, you, businesses you'd like to engage with in your speed dating. You know, why don't you start? Uh, we would love to talk to fashion brands that are interested in like, yeah, going their journey towards circularity, using design tools, incorporating more transparency on product level and on yeah, the full life cycle. So we would love to talk to fashion brands. Great. Lorraine? We would love to talk to anyone who is dealing with corporate sustainability data and has questions about that. Maybe you want to publish a report for the first time, maybe you've published many reports and you don't know why the message is not, is not landing. Do come talk to us and we'd love to, love to talk more with you. And Christoph? Yeah, we would like to talk to brands who either want to, still want to disclose their supply chain or are doing it, or they already disclosed their supply chain and now want to leverage the data. Fine. So talk to uh, the lady down the front here and she will set up these speed dates for you. I should also say that uh, Dennis and his colleague Salah will also be available to discuss anything that, uh, that from their presentations uh, in the media lounge uh, for now. But for now, um, it is lunchtime, hooray! Um, lunch is going to be served just down the hall to the left. You'll see to the left is a big restaurant area. Um, we will come back and start again at around 10 past two, so 14.10 uh, in just over half an hour's time. Enjoy your lunch and thank you for listening. It's been a great morning. Thank you very much indeed and thank you to the last panel. <laughs>